people make people. People make people. Now, back on Mother's Day, we we looked at the impact that mothers have on their children and what they end up becoming in life. However, it would be incomplete in lesson just to talk about mothers because fathers also have a tremendous impact upon making their children who they become as adults. So today I want to continue really with part two of the message, People Make People, with looking at the influence of fathers in the life of their family. Now my father was uh, not a church-going man growing up. My father uh, still does not attend church, not sure if he knows Christ or not. But my father had a great influence upon me growing up as a young man. He taught me many things about being tough and working hard and and being there and what it takes to survive in life. And so I want to share today a little bit about how that works in each of our lives. But... I want to go back to the Mother's Day message and share a statement, and I hope that you will take this in. It's a review uh, about who we are. You ever ask the question, who am I? So let's read this. We'll put it on the screen. Every person is like a coin. We have two sides. One side of each person is our self-will. You know that, right? The self-willed child. We have all heard the term the self-willed child. However, every person grows up to be a self-willed adult. Every person's life is directed by their internal self-will. It is a side where we make our own decisions, right or wrong. It is our soul or the control center of our life where we willfully say yes or no to the things in life. Now, next screen, please. The second side of the coin of people's lives is the side where we believe certain things. We act a certain way. We have certain values. We live a certain way because of the influence or the leadership of other people in our life growing up. If we examine our life, we will see that we are in many ways the person who raised us, taught us, or influenced our life as we grew up. Now, who are we? One side is the, one side of the coin is the self-will. The other side, we are the people who influenced our beliefs and values growing up. This is who we are. Therefore, in life, people make people. Very important. So when we look at who we are, we are in many ways the people who raised us, the people who influenced us. How many times has your spouse tell, had told you, you are just like your dad? And you're like, no, I'm not. How many times in your life has your spouse said to you, you are just like your mom? And we don't want to believe that we have those characteristics, but in many ways, we do. But then, although we have the influence of people in our life, our parents, our family, people who teach us how we're raised, the environment we're in, and although we have that influence, the other side of us is we what? We are very self-willed. And sometimes even though we have parents and we have influence and we have leadership that says to us, this is the right way, we still can be people that say, well, I know my parents might have taught me this, but I still am not going to do it. I'm going to do it my way. So I went through a period in my life when I was young, just like many of you, that, you know, when I was 18 or 19, I could have ran the whole world. I knew everything. My parents didn't know something. They should have just asked me because I I had it all together. I got grandkids now that think that. I mean, they're not even 
12, 13 years old. If you want to know something, you talk to them. So it is in life we have so much of influence on us from other people. We're a reflection of other people. But then we have to decide if we're going to do it or not. So let's pray. Father, this is the word that you've given me. It's not my word. It's your word. Help us to be people that think. I think what happens at times in church is sometimes we think the church is just emotional, although it does stir us emotionally. But God, we need to be thinking people. And we need to think about who we are, think about our life. Because who we are is what's controlling the decisions of our life and the choices that we make. And so, God, I pray that you'll open up our mind and heart. It's not my word again. I'm just the messenger here to deliver your word. But let us learn from this today and let us use it to impact our life so that we can be influencers of others in a positive way. And I ask it in Christ's name. Amen and amen. I've been a father now for many years. <clears throat> my wife and I, when I was 24, my wife was 21, 22, uh, God sent a 10-year-old boy our way, of which we took in when he was exactly 10, and we, uh, we brought him into our home, and we raised him. Then very next year, uh, we had our first daughter, and uh, so we had a 10-year-old boy, and we had a newborn in the house at the same time. So, and we were 24, 25 years of age. So I've been fathering a long time. And I think back upon those years. And uh, if my children were here today, I, I would tell them directly, is what I'm about to say, is that I look back upon raising my children and I made many mistakes, many mistakes. I was young, and I honestly didn't know what I was doing. You know, you do the best that you can with what you know at that time, amen? You don't, when you, you look back, that's why grandparenting is so great, because now I can look and say, I remember all those things, and I wish I'd have did them a little different. And... Uh, but here's what I, I've learned, is that I don't beat myself up over that because here's what I found out. There are no perfect parents, amen? All of us can look back raising our children and realize there were days that hey, we wish we had said things a little different, did something a little different. We all make mistakes. It's a part of being parents. And I recall when I was young, and we had our children, we were starting out our family. Now, everybody used to tell us how to parent. You ever remember those people? And what you should do, and how you should do it. And it was always the people that didn't even have kids that acted like they were the experts to tell us what to do. I remember back that even at our church, and I loved my church growing up, I learned a great deal there, they were wonderful. And, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, people in church, they think they got all the answers too. You know, well, Ricky, you just do this with your kids and do that with your kids. And we can't believe that people do. They don't even have kids. And it's a funny thing how that years would pass by and all of a sudden now they got kids. And, th and then them kids become teenagers. And all that advice that they had on how what you should do with your kids, they're not following any of it. And I wanted so much to go up to them and say, remember that time that you were trying to tell me how to raise my kids? How's it working out for you now? Because you don't know what you're going to do with your children until you get them, right? That's kind of what it is. People always say they know what to do, but wait till you get them. And they're just like you. And then it's you fighting them every day. So parenting is difficult. Nothing easy about raising and training and guiding another person and to keep them on the right path. So parents, you do the best you can. You pray for God to give you guidance and leadership. 
But along the way, you're going to make mistakes. So today, I want to introduce to you a father who had three sons. He is a very famous man in the Bible. His name is Noah. We all know who Noah was. He was, if you study his life, he was not a perfect man. He was a flawed man, just like we all are. But yet the Bible says that he found favor with God. And what he did, and what I believe that he did based on the Word of God, is that He did the very best thing that he could do for his children and his family. Hebrews chapter 11. Here's what God tells us. We'll put it on the screen. It says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, he moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for, what's it say, church? The saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now, God tells us something here very critically important. God has given us an example of a man that was flawed, he made mistakes, he wasn't perfect. But he saved his family. He saved his three boys from the destruction of the world. Now, if you've ever tried to raise boys, you will know that boys are very willful, very stubborn, and they're going to do it their way. Girls at times can be that way, but girls tend to be a little bit more compliant. They're sneaky about it. Boys would just tell you right out, okay, that I'm not doing it. I remember many times when my brother and I would tell my parents, we ain't doing that. Oh, that didn't go over too well. But my sisters, though, they were just sneaky. They just didn't tell people what they were doing. So Noah did something that I think that as fathers that we should all strive for. It should be the goal of our life is to save our family from the destruction of the world. Now, let me be crystal clear about this because I think many parents are just deceived and tricked or they don't know something there don't register. But listen to me, parents, especially if you have young children, teenagers, whatever age child you got, but especially if they're young. You better know And believe the fact that this world wants your children. You better know that. You better know that that Satan and the sinful influences and the world system will take your child and destroy their life. All the things that goes on in this world, all the traps of this life, is to take our children and brainwash them into believing things that are not true, getting them to go down a path in their life, and then one day as a parent, you'll be sitting at home with your hands over your eyes saying, man, the world's got my kid. The entire world system, the streets, the corruption, the lies, the alcohol, The drugs, speaking of alcohol, there was an article that just popped up on my phone about two weeks ago. I hadn't had time to read it all. And it wasn't even a Christian publication. And here's what the article, what's title was, is America Addicted to Alcohol. I'm like, I don't even have to read that. I know what that answer is. Alcohol, drugs, fornication, adultery, self-indulgence, partying, the entire beliefs of those outside knowledge of God is on a mission to lead our children to a life away from God, to a life without Jesus. Now, Noah lived in such a time. Actually, the Bible describes that Noah lived at a time that was actually worse than what we live in today, if you can believe that. And yet, he saved his boys, saved his family. 
Here's what it tells us about Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 12. Very important to read these verses. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on, in the earth. <clears throat> and what a statement this is. And that every intent of the faults of his heart was only evil continually. Now let me just, tell, let me just pause here and say when we get that word evil, let me tell you what, how the Bible really defines that overall. Evil is that which brings, in the end, pain and sorrow and hurt and destruction to the lives of people. They don't even realize they're doing it, that they're going on a path that's going to bring pain and sorrow. So every intent of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Now it tells us that God has emotions. Where do we get our emotions from? We got them because we were made in the image of God. So God, it grieved God in his heart to say that he had made people, and this is what people had become. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on earth, and it grieved in his heart, so the Lord said, I will destroy man of whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creepy things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But notice what it says. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. That's what I want to do. That's my desire of my life. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Then we go to the New Testament, in Luke chapter 17, and Jesus talked about this. And here's what Jesus said. And as it was in the days of Noah, how was Noah's days? So it will also be in the days of the Son of Man, which is Jesus. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus says that before He returns, His second coming, Jesus is coming again, that the society of which we will be living in will be like the same thing or the same society that Noah lived in. And a brief summary of the society that Noah lived in with his family, it was filled with sin, depravity, drunkenness, extreme violence. Every day of my life, I get up to drink a cup of coffee, and my wife says, you eat that same oatmeal every day, every day. I'm just like that. She said, you never eat anything different. I said, I like that maple and brown sugar oatmeal. I just eat that and drink coffee. And I turn the news on. I can't take you so much of it, but every day, this morning, guess what? Somebody got killed last night. Hampton, Newport News, Virginia Beach, Norfolk. Somebody got killed. Cities all over this world, Chicago, they say is the worst. Just hundreds and hundreds of people get shot all the time. It's violence. People killing people for no reason at all. 
Extreme violence, corruption. This was Noah's day. Corruption on all levels. Wickedness and evil. And every intent and thought to people's heart was just on wrong things continually. But here's the tragic part. The most unbelievable part of the whole story is that the people didn't even realize if, and if they realized, they didn't care. They didn't even realize. It, it reminds me so much of today that people just go on about their life when the Bible says that they were just eating and drinking and marrying and buying and selling and doing that. You know what it's telling us? That people were just so involved with the routine of their life and what they were doing, they, had, they just had no comprehension that one day they're going to die and stand before God. Life blinds us. The devil can't make us bad. He'll make us what? Busy. Right. So we get so busy with just the everyday routine of life. And here's what was the same thing occurred. This is what God's telling us. That the people had no idea that destruction was coming. People just living the events of their life without not one thought that one day... They're going to stand before God. That's, that's where we live today. You know, today, uh, let me tell you how church is today. It's like people, in a way, they act like they don't need church. They act like they don't need to come to church. People act like I'm just doing my life, and my life is what I'm doing, and, and that's so important. And if you invite people to church or if you try to talk to people about the Lord, people say, yeah, I'm busy. I got other things going on. They ain't got no thought whatsoever that one day they're going to stand before God. They're going to stand before God. No fear. So that's what we're living at. We're living in very similar times to Noah. Today our world is corrupt. It is just completely corrupt. You know the only place you're going to go to get truth? Church. And you might not get truth in a lot of churches. You're going to get truth in two places. The house of the Lord, if it's a Bible preaching church, and maybe your house. Other than that, the world runs on lies. It's corrupt. Everything's corrupt. Politics is corrupt. The school system's corrupt. People are violent. They shoot and kill people for no reason at all. People killing people every day. Corporations, places you work, corrupt. We are a nation addicted to alcohol and addicted to self-indulgences, the thoughts and intents on people's hearts. It's just to live my life the way I want to. Don't bother me. Let me do me. Not a care in the world. Don't even think that one day God's coming. Don't even think that one day they're going to die. No consideration today of God at all. It is, and if you talk to people about it, they just like, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, we got it, but we're going to still do what we want to do. That's that self-willed side of us. But yet we look at our society and we see all the people that's struggling, all the marriages and families and children and grandchildren and all the problems that people had and they're living off medication because they can't cope with life and they got to go to the therapist and then our school systems, it's just teaching our children lies. You got young kids, you better keep, keep them out of public school. They're going to teach them there's no God. They're going to teach them all, they're going to teach them things that's completely wrong. Yet, Noah's day. You know what makes Noah so remarkable? Is he lived in that. He lived in that society. And yet, the Bible says he saved his family. He found favor with God. He was able to influence his boys to follow him. That's a great thing. So what can we learn from, from Noah? We're going to put a couple things on the screen that I want to share with you about what God is telling us about what Noah did. Number one, Noah was not a man who conformed to the society in which he lived. 
Now, you're going to be one of two people. You're going to be a conformer or a non-conformer. My grandfather used to say, you're either an individual or a conformist. He told me that when I was a young boy. I had no idea what he was telling me. He said, Ricky, you'll grow up to be an individual or you'll be a conformist. Be an individual. Be you. Don't let other people. But see, people think that they're individuals, but they're not. We just kind of follow the herd, whichever way the herd goes. So here was Noah and his family, and Noah and his family were the only people that were saved. He didn't conform to the society in which he lived. And to save our family, you cannot be a father or a parent that conforms to the ways of the world. Noah lived a different life. Noah condemned the ways of the world. Listen to me, fathers and mothers today. The way the world says to parent today, don't listen to it. Don't. The world today says be best friends with your kids and never discipline them, never spank them, never tell them no. Just go along with their nonsense that they want to do. You will not be a biblical parent. And your children will grow up to be spoiled and rotten and feel entitled that they, they, you owe them a life. You don't owe them nothing. Put a roof over their head, you feed them, you take care of them, you got them. Do not listen to the parenting advice of today in this world. That's why we have all the disrespectful kids today that can't hold down a job and they can't survive in life. Marshmallows. No backbone. Can't stand on their own two feet because mom and dad just babied them their whole life instead of gave them a couple little spanks that they needed along the way. I got more spankings than I can count. It didn't hurt me one bit. Did I deserve it? Oh, yeah. My brother deserved more than I, but he was a, he was a schmoozer. Made me respect the Bible says that a father that doesn't discipline his kids don't love them. Parents. Noah condemned the world. Condemn means he said, I disapprove. I don't agree. I'm not doing it. Number two. Noah was a man. Noah was a man of God-fearing faith. He believed God. God told him, says, I'm going to make it rain. I'm going to flood the earth, build the ark. He believed it. 120 years before it happened. But it happened. And that shows you that God's grace, God doesn't want anyone to die. God doesn't want anyone to suffer. God wants everyone to come to Repentance and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 120 years. And through that time, he convinced his boys. Stay with me, sons. Three. Noah listened to God and he took action. Which is something that, I don't know what, you know, people will come to church all over this world. They watch messages on TV. They listen to all stuff. But it doesn't do any good to learn something and not put it into the practice of our life. You have to take action. How many times have I shared the story of James talks about the man in the mirror? The man gets up, looks in the mirror, and the mirror speaks and says, like I've shared with you many times before, comb your hair, brush your teeth, get that stuff out your eyes, shave, this, that, do all that. But if the mirror speaks and you say, I ain't doing that, and you walk away, what good does it do? That's what the Bible, the, the, the Bible is a book that says to us, it's a mirror. Here's things, it's talking to you, but you got to decide to do it. It doesn't do any good to come to church week after week after week and you hear 1,000 messages, but yet people don't apply it to their life you got to be a person of action. Faith 
without works is what, church? Dead. It's not faith at all. So Noah was a man to learn some from him that he took action. He believed it and, and, and did something. Four. Number four, nor did the right things, even though the world around him did not. Do right, even if no one else around you was doing right. I tell my kids this all the time. Been telling them for years. Dad, everybody else acts a certain way. I said, don't matter. You do right, even when no one else is doing right. You do right. Well, I want to give, I want to just give it back to them, Dad, as they gave it to me. I'm like, yeah, me too, but do right even when no one else is doing right. You say, well, I might be all alone. No, you're not. The Lord is with you. Do right. Noah didn't have anyone. He had his wife and his kids. Number five. Noah led his family to safety in life. How did he do it. A, first, with the help of God. You will not, you will not make it and raise your family and lead your children in the right way without God. It's not going to happen. The world will get them. The world will influence them. The world will take them from you You have to have God. I pray and still pray to be a better father. I was not always the best father. I pray to give my kids the advice that they need in the direction because sometimes it's not good. Sometimes I just get mad at them and I just want to boop, bark at them. Got to have God. You got to pray to be a better father. You got to pray to be a better mother. You got to pray to give your children the direction they need. And then when you have grandchildren, it's the same. You just can't do it without God. So the first thing was, is you need God's help. B, this is what I think is great. His children respected him because he lived a life before his sons that was true and honest and real. True and honest and real. Children, watch us. We can come to church and talk Jesus and all that stuff, but it's what we do in front of them that matters. It's how we act in front of them. It's how we respond to things in front of them. They know if we're real or not real. When They, they, don't, they won't respect us or follow us if they see that we, we say one thing, but we do another thing. Make sense? they got to see that we care about them and we love them and we're in their corner and we're cheering for them. And they got to understand that we will tell them when they're doing dumb stuff that it's dumb stuff. Amen? Amen? you got to tell them that. My parents had no hesitation. None at all. Me and my brother and sisters come in with dumb stuff. My parents would say, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. Why would anybody do that? Parents today, here's what parents today do. Oh, that is so wonderful. I am so glad. I support you. Yeah, you robbed and you, you, you beat people up and you shot people. We support you 100%. No, you're going to jail. And we ain't coming to see you. Because you were dumb and stupid. You love your children, but yet you have to give your children guidance and direction. And so you got to be real and honest and true. They know if if, if who you say you are, you got to live it in front of them. Rather see a sermon than hear one any day. So obviously his boys, Noah's boys, said, our dad is the real deal. He believes in God. He follows in God. He's not perfect. He makes mistakes. He has some bad days. But he's legitimate. He's real. C, Noah had leadership. Now, let me give you the one word that leadership is, just one. Leadership is influence. He had influence. Noah's sons would be influenced by the world or influenced by their father. 
The influence of their father was greater than the influence of the world. That was the difference maker. When, you, when you're a parent, your children will be either influenced by you or they'll be influenced by their peers and by their little goofy friends and, uh, you know, what they see on the Internet or Facebook. or who, who really influences the next generation? I'll tell you that my parents had a great influence on me in my life. I didn't get in a lot of trouble. Because the influence of my parents, I knew what would happen. My mother had a great influence spiritually upon my life. So the world around me was trying to influence me in one direction. But my parents had a stronger influence and a respect. Noah taught his boys about God. Noah's life with God that his son saw was greater than the influence of the world. Now, let me teach you one of the principles of Christianity that we have lost, gone. Christianity is really influence. That's what it is. Influence. We'll put it on the screen. We influence and lead our children to follow Jesus. That's what my mother did for me and my brother and my sisters. Our children influence their children to follow Jesus. Then together we influence others to follow Jesus. The true Christian life is a life of influence. <clears throat> That's leadership. Let me tell you how you know who's the leader in a group. Who the group is willing to follow. You're not the leader if the group won't follow you. You might want to be the leader. But if you don't have influence over the group of people to follow you, then you're not the leader. Somebody else is going to be leading. It's influence. Who's leading? So the real Christian life is influence. My mother influenced me to be a follower of Jesus. And it was a strong influence. Then I had my children. And I influenced my children to follow Jesus, live for Him. Now with my grandsons, I see my daughter and my son-in-law, they're teaching their boys about following Jesus. You see, the church of Jesus Christ used to be a place where we influenced the world. The, but now, let me tell you what's happened. The world has infiltrated the church, and now the world has influenced the church instead of us influencing the world. That's why the church has no power today. That's why that um, in many respects in some of your Mega churches, not all of them, but in some of them, they're just so diluted and watered down because they're so worldly. Ain't much Jesus there. Just a little bit of talk. But people go there. You know why? You know why they go there? Because they think, I can go to church here and I can still live my life the way I want to. If I go to this other church down here, then somebody's going to step on my toes and it's going to make me feel guilty about what I'm doing in my life. And I don't want that. I want to feel good about me, but I want to be able to live, do it my way. So here's the question. <clears throat> Are we living our life as fathers, as mothers, as parents, as grandparents, as Christians to where uh, we have influence and respect from other people. Are we in any way influencing others as Noah obviously? Can you imagine? Think about this. He had three grown boys. <clears throat> they had wives. And you know what happens when they get a wife. The wife's talking about, don't listen to your dad. He don't know what he's talking about. We're going to do what we want to do. We ain't getting in that stupid ark. 
No, forget that. I mean, he's been working on that thing for 120 years. Look, it ain't, you see any rain? Ain't no floods. Ain't no rivers overflowing. 120 years. <clears throat> Somehow, Noah had influence not only on his sons, but on his daughters-in-law. Now, that was the miracle right there. And they said, we're with you. You say, get on this ark to save our life. We're, going, we're with you. So parents, God has called you fathers to be an influencer. And if God called you to build an ark, who would get on it with you? Willfully. So you might be thinking, well, Pastor Rick, <clears throat> my children are grown. They're adults. They don't live the life that I wish they lived. <clears throat> they don't live for Jesus. What am I to do now? So let me tell you what to do if you have grown children. Never, ever give up on your kids. Never. Never, ever stop praying for them. Pray for them every day. <clears throat> Maybe a couple times a day that God's Spirit will speak to them, and even though they might be 25 or 35 or 40 or 50, whatever their age is, and they're not living for the Lord, just pray for them, pray for them, pray for them, every day, pray for them. <clears throat> and then you try to be an encouragement to them, and you love on them, and you're there for them, and every time that God opens up a door for you to talk to them a little bit, you talk to them as much as you can. But you got to know when to stop. You can't just go on and on because it pushes them away. Know what to say and then leave it alone and then give it up, give it to God. <clears throat> just know that, let them know that you love them and you are their greatest cheerleader and you want nothing but the best for them. And maybe it might even be go back and say, you know what, when I raised you, I did the best I could, like what I have to tell my kids. I, but I did make some mistakes along the way, and I'm sorry. I wish I'd have done some things differently, but I'm here for you now. Amen? That's what you do. You never give up on your children. <clears throat> up until my mother passed away, I remember she prayed for us and called us. <clears throat> and asked us what we were doing, tried to tell us stuff. And I've told you this before, it was funny. I just started laughing, but <clears throat> my mom didn't think it was funny because she was uh, trying to tell me something. And I said, Mom, I know I got this. I know what I'm doing. I said, Mom, let me share something with you. And she said, boy, don't you talk to me like that. She said, I'm the mom. You listen to what I have to say. <laughs> and I just started laughing. I said, okay, Mom. I got it. Never give up on your kids. <clears throat> pray for them. 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 Keep praying for them. I tell you, I've told you this so many times. And my daughter, Elizabeth, my middle daughter, she's not where she needs to be, but we're praying. I'm praying for her all the time that she'll, you know, get back in church and you know, as she was raised, but I tell you, it's funny that I'll pray for her sometimes. I say, yeah, I'll pray for you today that God will make you miserable. <laughs> Stop, Dad. I don't want to be. I said, yeah, I'm just praying that you'll be so unhappy that you'll run back to the Lord. Uh, fathers, <clears throat> on Father's Day, let me tell you, the greatest cause in our life is to save our children from the clutches of the world. It's the greatest. I don't care what your cause is in life. You don't have a greater cause than saving your children from the world. Put aside all of your stuff. Well, I got this going on in my life. Not important or as important as your children. I've had people that <clears throat> I talked to a lady this week. She says it's been 17 years since I spoke to my daughter. We had a falling out. What should I do? I said, make it right. Well, it really won't my fault. I said, well, that's the problem. Just say it is. It ain't worth it. It ain't worth to be separated from your children. 
Do what you can do to make it right. You say, well, they're the ones that did it. Don't matter. Swallow your pride and make it right. Well, my kids borrow money and they're paying me back. To forget the money. It ain't worth it. My kids said this, did that. Well, I'm sure that they did. I said thanks to my parents that won't write neither. Nothing. Save your children. Make it right. Make it right. Our children's got to see in us a, uh, an authentic realness that we have something that they need to follow so we can influence them. Noah's influence was so great, he saved his family. The world wants you kids. You got to fight and fight and fight and say no to the world. Condemn the world to save your sons and your daughters and your grandkids. Never forget, people make people. And you're the one making a mark on the people in your family. People make people. Let's bow for prayer. Father, <clears throat> I thank you for the people that influenced my life. Without them, I wouldn't be here today. Great people that influence me to say no to the world and to say yes to Jesus. And because of that, I've been blessed beyond what I deserve. And God, I look at our world today and I see people just going on with life. No concern about one day they're going to stand before you and give an account for their life. And it could be today. And then I look at all the thousands of children. I think about the children we have in this church and how I want them to come here and learn the truth about Jesus. Not just go through a Sunday school class and do games but to learn about Jesus. To instill in them something that will be in their heart for the rest of their life. And they'll live it. Nothing would thrill my soul any more than to see the, the kids in this church just grow up to be great men and women of God. Then we will have succeeded. Then we will have passed on Jesus to the next generation. And so, God, <clears throat> I pray for the heart of every person in this room. There may be somebody here today that <clears throat> they're not sure if they died today that heaven would be their home, and one day they're going to stand before you. And I pray, God, that they will make a decision right now to say, yes, I want to believe in Christ as my Savior <clears throat> and live for Him. How do they do that? They just need to have a conversation with you from their heart. Whisper a prayer. Tell you, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask for forgiveness. And I want to follow you, Jesus. I believe that you are who you say you are, the Son of God. Died on the cross of my sins. Resurrected from the grave. This day I give my heart and life to you. Let them do that today. And then maybe there's some Parents here that they need to stand firm and don't let the world influence their children. Maybe there are some people here today, God, that they just need your strength and power, whatever that is. So with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, whatever you need to talk with God, you with, just whisper right where you're at. Talk to God. Whatever you need to share him with Him right now, you share it. He's listening.
Father, thank you that we have you. Thank you that we have that solid rock to stand on. The rest of the world is on sinking sand. But we have that rock and his name is Jesus. Help us to be the influencers in our life that you've called us to be. That's what Christianity is supposed to be, God. We've lost that along the way. Help us to save our children in the next generation, to be the fathers that we need to be, to be the mothers that we need to be. And God, give us your strength. We live in a world that's contrary to who we are as Bible-believing Christians, but help us to stand strong and to follow you, even in a world that doesn't believe. Thank you for this time we've met together. In Christ's name, amen and amen.